Welcome. My name is Linda Booth. I serve in the Council of Twelve Apostles and as Director of Communications for the Community of Christ. And I welcome you to this interview with our President, Stephen M. Vesey. Steve, we've been off of a world conference that was quite historic and about 2,200 uh, delegates have gone home to their nations to tell the testimony of what they experienced during World Conference. I've heard many people say that what they experienced was the Spirit in our midst. How would you describe the World Conference experience? I, I would express it in the words, it was great. Uh, especially when you go through all of the planning and preparation for months and months and then have such a successful experience with the delegates from throughout the world is just really a cause for joy and, and celebration. I've been reflecting a lot on what really happened at conference and what's the meaning of the experience that we shared together. And in some ways I'm still looking for the words and images and phrases to adequately describe it to those who, who didn't have the opportunity to be there. I'm tending to use phrases I'm hearing the, the delegates use, and they say, we were blessed. Uh, we felt the Spirit moving in our midst just on occasion, but just a, a constant presence with us. I was talking to one church leader recently who said it was the most spiritual conference that he had ever experienced among all the conferences. And I don't know that you can compare them that way because each one is unique, but that seems to be the general sense. People have awe and wonder uh, in response to the spirit that we experience together. And it was a spirit of um, celebration, but also uh, appropriate seriousness when that was called for. Decorum, unity, careful listening to one another, uh, respectfulness uh, among people who have differences, strong differences of opinion, but there was a sense of unity that just was woven throughout the whole experience. And I think we can take a great deal of hope from that as a people, that God is with us, uh, God is fulfilling God's Word because God has promised us that if we will bring ourselves together in a certain attitude and humility and preparation, that we'll be blessed in that way. Uh, in my conference sermon, I concluded after sharing an illustration from our history uh, with the phrase, forward, forward or, or back. back, can't stay where we are. And I basically said it was up to the church to decide. And out of the spirit of the conference, I think the church gave a resounding forward. And that's the spirit of the conference as, as I understand it. Yes, there was a tenderness in our midst. Yes. Uh, a sweet tenderness, and, and it is hard to put into words when the divine is in your midst, it's hard to find words that express in a way that truly reflects the experience. Yeah. I, I've begun to compare its importance to the day of Pentecost mm -hmm. in terms of the transformation that occurred in the early Christian community, and yet it wasn't an experience as, as that one is described so dramatic I've begun to refer to it as our, our Pentecostal experience or Pentecost experience with unity and peace and, and reconciliation and healing that's just as important to the mission and witness of the church today as it was to the early Christian fellowship when they were challenged to go out with their witness of, of Jesus Christ. Personally, uh, I experience the Spirit in, in new dimensions of my life that I hadn't experienced before. Uh, when I was away from the conference assembly and uh, waiting for the conference to consider and take action on the words of counsel, 
It was a time of complete peace for me. And I found myself resting in the experience. And what seemed like a longer time to other people, I don't remember it that way, even though it went over several days. It was almost like, this is okay. You rest, and the conference is doing its work, and you don't need to be anxious or concerned. Just let that unfold. And it was a center, uh, uh, an oasis of peacefulness for me personally that I now mark as one of the significant experiences of, of my life in terms of how the Spirit blesses us. Yes, absolutely. We can praise God for that experience together yes. and hope that those who are not able to attend World Conference will have a sense of that spirit. Yes, that's, through, that's my prayer and hope. Will, will that occur? And I, I think it is in some ways. I think it is too. Uh, there was also an element of this World Conference because before and after World Conference, uh, international leaders gathered for significant Bible study, reflection, and consideration of questions. And how do you think that gathering and how those leaders' intentional study and reflections impacted World Conference? The international leaders meeting is always an inspiring and joyful experience when the leaders of the church from all the nations where the church is established come together and, and we have a chance to become reacquainted. Uh, typically we have relationships with each other, but just the joy of being in each other's presence begins the experience. During the International Leaders Meeting, after a time of study of the scriptures, we began to discuss the issues of conference. And I was concerned um, about how that would occur, knowing the intensity of feelings around some of the issues and uncertainty and anxiety. As we entered into those sessions each evening, the, the spirit of openness and peacefulness, of tenderness and sensitivity that characterized the World Conference actually began to bless us in the beginning days of the International Leaders Meeting. And that's when I began to sense that a similar blessing would be coming to the World Conference. And many people have now verified that that, that was the case, but as people dialogued with each other, there was this deeper or higher level of spiritual sensitivity, ever how you want to describe it, that became obvious and it was working across cultures. People who spoke different languages with the help of the translators were understanding at a deeper level. And we can only say that that is the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our midst preparing us to share the witness of the gospel with the world, just as the scriptures promise. After World Conference, the International Leaders Meeting continued, and there were still a lot of questions. You know, what, what do the decisions of the conference mean? How will we live those out? And so we continued to have Q&A, questions and answers, discussions, very specific questions, but the spirit continued after the conference. So it wasn't just one day, one event. It wasn't sporadic. It was like a consistent presence throughout pre-conference activities, conference and post-conference activities. And I think we can rejoice in that. And then in the multi-nations group, we had a closing communion service in the temple sanctuary. Same spirit of peace, confidence in the future of the church, hope, people recommitting themselves. The African and Haitian ministers of the church were in charge of that whole experience. They presided, they prayed, they provided direction and the African and Haitian ministers served the communion to the whole group. And when I saw that happening and realized the kind of depth and maturity of ministry that was being expressed by the church out 
among the nations of the world that has occurred just over a few decades in terms of the emergence of these leaders, uh, the Spirit witnessed to me that this is pleasing to God and that we should take joy in what was unfolding even in that communion service to see those ministers carrying out every aspect of the worship. It was just wonderful. Yes, yes, certainly. And, you know, their preparation was combined with the preparation of the church for World Conference. Yes. Because we heard the testimonies and witness of many people whose congregations had gathered to pray for and to consider the words of counsel. And so the ca conference itself, not only the preparation of the people coming, but the preparation of the people who su supported mm -hmm the delegates and the leaders who came to World Conference. But even at World Conference, there was a, an infusion of opportunities for not only spiritual, going deeper in spiritual practices, but also spirit-filled worship. So what do you see God trying to do with us as a people? Are we learning the power of preparation and discernment and indeed what it means to be life long, whole stewardship? Yeah. Well, I, I think so. And if, if I could just put it very bluntly, I think God is saying, see, I told you so. <laughs> because if you look back uh, in multiple sections of the Doctrine and Covenants, there is this invitation from God, again, saying, if you will prepare yourselves through study, and through spiritual discipline and openness, if you'll come together in love with your eye, eyes towards the purposes of the kingdom, then there will be this outpouring of my spirit, and it will be obvious, it will be noticeable to you. And that's exactly what happened at World Conference. Through the careful prep preparation around discernment of conditions of membership, which included a heavy emphasis on spiritual practices, prayer, meditation, but also discussion and dialogue, understanding that spiritual formation is not just a private matter or a personal matter, it's a community formation. So that all occurred. I think releasing the, the council to the church in January, which was in part made possible by the preparation of the people that had already occurred. And then all of the discernment and prayer and discussion afterwards. And we intentionally designed the World Conference to begin with worship. We had a powerful communion service. I mean, this, and what better way to prepare for the World Conference experience than to be together as the worldwide body and, and share in the Lord's Supper. But we focused on spiritual formation and spiritual practices first. And there's always this human tendency, let's get to the issues. Let's, let's take care of them. But we intentionally slowed down so that we could take time to do what God had rather strongly urged us to do as a people so that we would be able then to continue to grow in our capacity as a spirit-led prophetic people. And that's what God is, is calling out of us in terms of our heritage, our current experience. I think the key now is to learn from that and not stop doing it. It has to happen at every level of the church and, and not go back to where we were before, but to continue to emphasize these kinds of practices and disciplines so that we will continue to, to enhance the spiritual condition of our faith community. And I think we'll be blessed as we continue to do that. So yes, we have learned and we wanna build on that learning. And I look forward to the future. I do too. And you're talking about all levels, all, yes. all levels. And so I know leaders are, are committed to practicing 
daily spiritual yes. discernment practices to help us to discern God's call to us and to the church. But what, where else you, you see it individually and, and how do you see that being played out in the church? Well, it, it always has to begin with the individual. Uh, and even though I felt I was prayerful prior to this time of preparation for conference and conference, the process of preparation called me to explore some new spiritual disciplines and practices and to spend more time doing that. So we all have to start with ourselves first. But I think it really is an area for congregations to begin to give more attention to. And I think a lot of the issues, the relational issues, maybe the tensions, the sometimes sense of uh, anxiety about the future or what I call missional malaise, we don't know exactly what to do, that those issues would be addressed as we more spiritually root ourselves and deepen ourselves in the Spirit of God in Jesus Christ, which is always seeking to lead us into the kinds of relationships and mission that God wills for our lives. And in our busyness, again, we want to get to the tasks before doing the preparation, where if we did the preparation first, the task would become more an overflow of our lives in terms of ministry. On Sunday night, you presented a sermon, which was a high point for me personally, and I've heard many people talk about that. It was a sermon entitled, We Share a Vision, and which is, by the way, printed in the May Herald and can be read or viewed on the church's website. And the sermon resulted in multiple spontaneous moments of applause. It started off Today, with you reflecting and celebrating some milestones. For example, 25 years the since the first women were ordained. And, and 150 years ago, the conference the of the reorganization where Joseph Smith III accepted his call to be a prophetic leader of, of the new church movement. The uh, the but while the church focused briefly on the past. It really was more about moving forward in God's mission. So what is the unique interplay of our church's heritage with God's call for us today? Well, it was uh, a challenge and an opportunity at conference to both uh, be um, aware of and respectful of our heritage because we had reached a certain milestone, the 150th anniversary of the Conference of the Reorganization where Joseph Smith III accepted the mantle of prophetic leadership. And so the question is one that we wrestled with through our conference preparation and I personally reflected on as I prepared the sermon. What I discovered was that our heritage and our history is a rich source of story and illustration that is not just an account of what happened in the past, but it continues to guide us into the future because they are stories of faithfulness. They are stories of courage, of being able, willing to risk in response to God's call, of being open to the new thing that God is doing. And those stories come out of our heritage and they are companions on our journey into the future. I have a deep, deep appreciation for our history and heritage as a church, the whole history of the church. I, I remember my grandmother once walking me through a cemetery near the campgrounds at Foundry Hill in Tennessee, where I grew up in the camping and reunion programs of the church. I now refer, it to, refer to it as my heritage walk because my grandmother took me through the cemetery and she pointed out the generations of my family who had been church members. And she was instilling within me a sense of heritage and my place in it. But I also know she was pointing me to the future. And that was the interplay. It was kind of like, now, what are you going to do? <laughs> as a faithful disciple and church member. When, when the actor por portraying Joseph Smith III came on the rostrum Saturday night with the gavel 
that President Smith had used for so many years and handed it over to me, I was so overcome with a sense of uh, appreciation for heritage, joy in the moment, and responsibility for the future of the movement. And, but, but when the portrayer of Joseph Smith III, who really looked like Joseph Smith III, uh, said how pleased he was to see how the church had gone from a small, fairly loosely knit together group to an international fellowship that spans that the, small the globe, I actually sensed the joy of our faith ancestors in the nature of the movement today. And I just wish more people could experience that aspect of what, what we're all about. Uh, it's respectful towards heritage but we've learned we don't worship our history, but our history is a companion as we move into the future. The enduring principles uh, outlined in the We Share document that we, we used at conference and is being distributed throughout the church are very faithful to our heritage, and yet they lend themselves to relevant expression in the world today in a very changing and dynamic world. So, as the saying goes, we have deep roots, but we also have wings. And that's the nature of this faith movement. It is, and you keep referring to us as a movement, yes. which means that it's not static, it's dynamic, it's moving forward. It's, di it's dynamic. Yes. Um, yes. And open yeah. to God's lead. And that's the key. It is the key, yes. And that's where our enduring principles keep us open like continuing revelation, blessings of community, mission. Yes. Section 164 recognizes uh, the baptismal covenant, and we're talking about movement forward because yes. it really does move us forward in understanding in a very profound and perhaps a very life-changing way for us as a faith movement. And so section 164 recognizes the baptismal covenant of those who were baptized in Christ in other denominations. And it gives them the opportunity to live out their discipleship in this faith movement through the sacrament of confirmation. So what do you believe will be the impact of this new understanding about baptismal covenant? Well, that's a question I'm sure we're going to continue to to live into as we go into the future because we may not be able to see all of the blessings and enrichments that will come to the church. I think we're now at a place where we can have a strong, clear sense of identity. We can have a, a, a normative or standard understanding and practice of baptism in the community of Christ. Baptism by immersion, full immersion, by priesthood, the appropriate priesthood, when someone is at least eight or older. We can have a normative practice without categorically excluding the experiences of others and recognizing that God's grace is not limited or confined to our understanding or practice, but our understanding and practice is very much within God's will. We can actually do both. And that's the witness of the Spirit. Now, I personally think the impact is going to be there are people who have been waiting for this opportunity to affirm their original commitment, who feel called to express their discipleship, in the community of Christ, and they will now move forward and make that fuller commitment to membership through confirmation, and we will, we will receive their gifts. We will receive how they enrich the faith community and empower our mission. So 
that's the initial impact that I see happening in the life of the church, and it'll be a, a blessing to us. Now, people are going to hear me in the future continuing to emphasize that section 164 is not just about how do we relate to other baptized Christians. If we look at it carefully, it actually says perhaps our greatest concern should be are we living the meaning of our own baptism daily in our lives? Yeah, we tend to worry about the baptisms of others. There are appropriate theological and sacramental boundaries that we maintain. But really, the call is for each one of us to continue to grow in the, our understanding and meaning of baptism. And all the other sacraments of the church help us do that. So I see it as just an added enrichment to the church that says we're confident in who we are, but that doesn't mean we have to deny the experiences of others. And it calls each one of us to deepen our own discipleship, doesn't it? Yes. yes. That's, that's the real underlying yes. message. Yeah. With the World Conference's overwhelming support of Section 164, the First Presidency made a decision that about 20 pieces of legislation related to human sexuality would not be considered by the delegates. So, indeed, uh, paragraph 7 in Section 164 allows for field or national conferences, which provides a new way for the church in different places to address issues that are a priority there. So, in the future, uh, that may mean that policies in one nation may be different than other nations. So, <laughs> what will the impact of this new way of addressing issues and possibly setting different policies in different nations mean to us as a people? Well, some of that remains to be seen, and I'm not going to try to predict what all it means. Uh, here's my perspective at this point. I believe, as a result of the church's uh, approval and support of Doctrine and Covenants 164, that we have been blessed by some additional wisdom that's very relevant to the um, situation of the church today, but will also continue to be relevant in the future when we're dealing with issues that we cannot even begin to imagine today. And so what you see in 164 is a balancing of principles that are very much a part of the church's life. And now they're being expressed in some new dimensions because of the growing complexity of issues and the growing um, complexity of the global situation. I'll try to uh, explain that. 164 basically says the World Conference needs to really focus on foundational principles that are understandable and operative throughout the world. And then 164 gave some of those principles and the World Conference did come to consensus around them. And now those principles can guide church leaders who are dealing with particular issues in particular cultural and political and social and religious settings to figure out where the church is at in its development, the impact of cultural factors, the impact of religious and political, even legal factors, which are different throughout the whole world. They now have the guidance but the decisions about how it gets lived out are moved closer to the point of implementation. And more of those who will be impacted by those decisions have an opportunity to be part of the decision making. Many of them who could never even dream about coming to World Conference, much less get there, will have an opportunity to be involved in the discussions. And so that's an even better expression of the principle of common consent that we try to live out at, at the World Conference. 
Secondly, the provision for national and field conferences allows creativity according to the condition of the church in various parts of the world. What I mean by that, in some parts of the world, there's much more experience with democratic, uh, common consent, consensus building processes. In other parts of the world, there is no experience with that. People look to the village chief, the pastor, the elders to make those kinds of decisions. And so we've created opportunity and space for appropriate models of conferencing, reasoning, making decisions together to emerge in different parts of the world that will actually be better and more healthy for those parts of the world. So that's the excitement that, that I sense in terms of the um, provisions within Doctrine and Covenants 164 for those experiences to unfold in the life of the church. As we do that, it will be even more important to be clear about what holds us together. And so we look again to the We Share document and we look at our vision. We look at our mission. Um, several years ago, I was at a village in Africa and they were celebrating the dedication of a new church. And a young girl came up and stood before an assembly of three or four hundred people. And she, and she must have only been four or five years old. She summoned up all of her strength and courage in front of all of these adults. And she said, we are community of Christ. We proclaim Jesus Christ and we promote communities of joy, hope, love, and peace. And the whole crowd just erupted in cheers. But the significance of that to me was that we have a mission statement that's understandable throughout the world in all the generations of the church. And so now when I travel places, I ask the children, what is the mission of the church? If they can tell me, then I know we're on the right track. And that's, that's binding us together as a worldwide church fellowship. The enduring principles are essential to that. That binds us together. Those principles are lived out in the life of the church. Our church seal, powerful, unifying symbol that is part of the life of the church throughout the world, especially our sacraments. The sacraments, have, as some have said, are the international language of the church because of the symbolism and how they are done there's a consistency throughout the whole church. Our basic beliefs hold us together. But then one of our principles is to allow for this process of consensus and expressing in relevant terms our basic beliefs, our principles, our vision, our mission. And that's where more and more people get involved locally. So I think it, it bodes well for the future. And it actually is a better model for an international church fellowship than perhaps some of the models we had. When we looked out at the World Conference First, Assembly this time, there were hundreds of delegate seats vacant. Choir. That wasn't because people didn't want to be there. They desperately wanted to be there. They were not allowed visas by the U.S. government to enter the country. So they were disenfranchised from the decision-making at World Conference. So we have to find some new ways of balancing the prerogatives of the World Conference and involving as many people as possible in decision-making. And that's what 164 provides for. Yes, it does. And the excitement I feel as you describe this new process and new opportunities, I think about your first comments about the Holy Spirit knitting us together and weaving us together and, and how Section 164 now allows a new way for the yes. unity to be in different ways expressed yes. in other places. So it is an exciting time for the church yeah. as God leads us and helps us to understand. And I'm really glad you pointed that out because fundamentally it is the Holy Spirit that binds all of this yeah. together.
together. Yeah. And it works through all of those aspects of who we are, the sacraments, the basic beliefs, the vision, the mission, our scriptures, so forth and so on. Yeah. That's all the Spirit uses those as tools yes. to bind us together. Yes, praise God. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> another, another powerful moment for many of us that we're attending World Conference was the introduction that you made to the presiding bishopric's presentation of the budget. And in that, you talked about the challenges of funding an international church in mission. And so, could you please share again with those who were watching uh, this uh, presentation and interview, could you share again how we are to call to deepen our discipleship through the generosity of our lives? That, that was a very personal statement for me. As I said, typically the presiding bishopric would provide commentary as we were introducing that legislation, uh, budget projections, and so forth. But I felt a sense of, of urgency to speak to the church in that moment um, because I think this is an area where we're going to have to go deeper in our understanding. Now, prophet presidents of the church for decades, all the way back to the beginning of the church, uh, prophetic witnesses in the New Testament, prophetic witnesses in the Old Testament or First Testament, have all said that our generous response, our, our giving, our offering, is how we most appropriately receive and respond to God's grace within our lives. And we keep working on that basic understanding. We've got good terminology for that, grace and generosity, disciples' generous response, stewardship, offering, sacrificing. But there is a gap between what we profess and our habits and attitudes and the disciplines of our lives in terms of our giving. And that's critical to the future of the church. There is no separation between being a disciple and being a steward who generously supports to one's capacity, whatever that may be. In some parts of the world, people have great capacity. In other parts of the world, people give their groundnuts and their eggs and their chickens but they're giving according to their capacity to support, and this is the key part, the local ministries of the church, congregationally and mission center, but also the worldwide ministries of the church. So it is about budgets and funding, but if we stop there, we miss the point and we miss the meaning. God throughout the generations has given us the principle of tithing to help us know how to respond to God's grace and God's gift in Jesus Christ. And, and we have to get that into our minds and our hearts. And so my statement was to say, this is important, it's important to me. Me and my family are going to try, and we will, we'll increase our ways of giving and our capacity for giving. I'm calling on the church to do that. I'm calling on everyone at conference to go back and be the voice for that. Because there is a direct link between our tithing contributions to local and world ministries and the ministry that we're able to provide, that God is calling us to provide. And so if people are giving generously out of growing capacity, the ministries of the church expand. If they are not, they contract. And that responsibility rests on all of us. I also said it is now our clear expectation that the priesthood of the church who represent the community of Christ. 
They are ministers throughout the world. Many minister primarily locally, but their ordination is authorized by the worldwide community of Christ, are expected to give to both local ministries and world ministries. There is no separation there. And if that has been missed in our understanding of membership commitment, of priesthood commitment, then I'm greatly concerned about that. Uh, I believe before a person is ordained in terms of new priesthood calls, they should be a contributor to both local and worldwide ministries of the church because what we do with our resources, in this case financial resources, is the clearest indicator of where our real priorities are, where our hearts are. I think Jesus said something about that, that it's a tangible indication of where our real commitment is. Uh, someone else said, I look at what I do and then I know what I really believe. Not what I say, but what I do. If there is not um, better response and broader response in the church, then the ministries contract. They don't go away. We'll continue to do what we can do, but they contract. And so the services, the resources, the ministerial personnel, the missionary projects are all impacted by that. And it's a personal responsibility, how we understand discipleship. So that's not exactly the statement I made, but I think that one's going to be printed. Yes. But that's the concern behind it. It's a spiritual issue. It's not just a financial or budgeting issue. It's a spiritual issue. And we're going to have to do better. Yes. And it is a spiritual issue. Uh, at World Conference, there were many sacred moments. In fact, I believe that was a sacred moment when you expressed heartfelt uh, challenge to the church to go deeper in discipleship in response through their generosity. I also, for myself, in your sermon, there were two questions that you asked that challenged me each day. And for me, they're a very sacred moment and continue to be lived out in my life as sacred reminders. And the two questions were, what, so what, kind what do of we think? What kind of church do, do we really, really want, want to, be? to be? But more importantly, and this or is the question better. that really haunts me, what, what kind, kind of, of, church of church does, does God, God want, want us, us to be? To be? Uh -huh. So how will our answers impact our ability to respond to God's call to join with God in mission? Well, I'm glad it had that kind of impact. Uh, if you look back through the scriptures, sometimes prophetic ministers pose important questions and they keep the right questions in front of a people of faith. And then the people have to live answers to that. Um, for me, it's really a third question. What is the degree of gap or alignment between the church we really want to be <laughs> and the church God really wants us to be? If that is becoming more aligned, then I, which I think it is, I see signs of that, then I believe the experience that we are beginning to have is that we are becoming the community of Christ that God is calling us to become. A community that reflects the passion of Christ, the message of Jesus Christ, the personality of Jesus Christ, if people can understand it that way, a congregation that is experienced by others as the face of Christ, if I could use that metaphor. They encounter the Christ in that congregation just like the early followers encountered Christ who was in His actual presence. That's the kind of alignment that I'm talking about. And that will be a community of love, of reconciliation, of inclusiveness, 
of celebration of giftedness, of recognition of the sacredness of human lives and relationships. As that community emerges, then we'll begin to understand the great passion that Christ had for proclaiming the coming reign of God in creation, the peaceable reign of God, the kingdom of God, the Zion of our hopes, the Zion past generations have sacrificed for, will begin to be experienced spiritually and relationally, which will have an impact on our physical lives and, and all aspects of, of who we are. So, what kind of church does God want us to be? And what's the gap? Do our own desires and agendas for the church line up with that? And that's the creative tension of that, of that question. Now, I believe that over recent years, recent sections of the Doctrine and Covenants clearly articulate the vision of the church that God wants us to be. It is not a departure from the church we have been. It's a fulfillment of the church we have been becoming all these generations. The We Share document clearly articulates a vision of that in, in all of its different aspects. Church leaders have been articulating that in sermons and articles in the Herald. I don't think we can say anymore that we do not have an understanding of who we are. Now, some people may not agree with it, and I understand that. But we have ample light and understanding of who we are and who we are called to be. The question is, do we have the courage and the faith to align our lives and the lives of our congregations with that vision? And so that's the nature of the question. <laughs> it is, and in section 164, points us outward. Yes. It, it's uh, from us to other. And it also points out what you, the answer that you just gave, it points out, are we going to just be hesitant? And are we going to be fearful? And we're going to be caught up in our own securities? Or are we going to move forward in our divine call and the vision that God has given for this faith movement? Yes. And so, that mission of Jesus Christ, it says, is what matters most for the journey ahead. So where do you see God's divine call and vision for the church leading us? Well, I, I see it leading us into the fulfillment of the heart of the restoration movement as I understand it because the restoration movement is about recovering in each generation the clarity and passion of Christ and the first communities of disciples, the first communities of Christ, if you will. And they were noted for their generosity, their, their unity and their fellowship, even in the midst of very difficult issues that are comparable to the issues that we're dealing with today. In those days it was, what do we do with food sacrificed to idols? Or what do we do with the Hebrew traditions? And they felt just as passionately about those issues as people feel about the issues we're dealing with today. But that fellowship was also noted for its witness, its outreach. It was countercultural. That is, it stood out from the mainstream politically, also socially and culturally. And that's what I see the community of Christ becoming. But it's nothing to be feared. <laughs> I, I know there are voices of uh, dissent who are trying to raise alarm. And, and section 154, that's what it's partially referring to when it says competing loyalties. Is our loyalty ultimately to God? to the world and voices around us, we have to choose now. My hope 
is that we will choose our loyalty to God who has been very clear in God's calling to the church. And as we move into the future, it will be a time of greater joy and meaning and fulfillment. And we caught a taste of that at World Conference. We, we learned that the issues do not have to be the primary agenda. The mission of Jesus Christ is what matters most. And if we stay focused on that, then we can address the issues. And perhaps from new perspective and understanding that allows us to resolve them and, and move ahead. But I think it's more joy, more love, more hope, more healing, more reconciliation is what awaits us in the future. Well, thank you, Steve, for taking this opportunity to share with us reflections from World Conference. And so I say to my brothers and sisters who are watching and participating in this interview, may God's peace and grace fill you, and may you and your congregation be the people that God is calling and leading in mission is our prayer. Amen. Amen.